Buena sera and welcome to the Rangers Rabble podcast as tonight we bring you a very special edition of the podcast with an Italian twist. So please stand by as and be prepared for as many Italian themed puns as a Bob Malcolm ice cream van. So <laughs> let, us make, let us make you an offer that we can't refuse as tonight we're the destination for all things Serie A and the Football Italia golden era of Channel 4's coverage seasons 1992 to 2002 so sit back relax let's embark on a 60 minute nostalgic journey through the rich tapestry of italian footballs yesteryear and delighted to see you joining me on the podcast tonight is our very own version of the midnight mafia i'm joined tonight by mr scott Kerr, robert and brian scott how are we I'm no bad, David. Midnight Mafia, I mean like Midnight Express. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto, how are we, my friend? Mate, what an intro. Absolutely <laughs> bravo. Um, I Listen, that sets us up nicely and I'm, I've am i been salivating at this all day. Really can't wait to get the tour into it. And Brian, fresh from uh, this afternoon's uh, Women's Cup final, uh, you know long in? Yeah, I'm virtually in the door. As soon as I came on the... On the link, I was literally in the door. Um, yeah, I was cutting it fine, but good day. A trophy lifted, so that's two for the club this season. So hopefully an hour, four, an hour four to come. Uh, and just uh, to respond to Aldo in the comments, the reason that I'm not wearing my uh, football Italia top tonight is sadly I don't fit into it anymore, Aldo, and they don't can he make them in my size anymore. So we'll just have to bypass that for just now. But tonight, a wee bit of context for our viewers watching at home. The four of us on the podcast tonight, I've been sort of charged with um, selecting our greatest 11 from the era. So the, the sort of rules that we come up with is that we pick 11 players in any formation, but we're only allowed one player per team. So, for example, if Buffon was your goalkeeper, you would have to decide whether it's Buffon from the Parma years or Buffon from the Juventus years, and that would rule out, you know, whether you were allowed another Parma player or Juventus player going forward. So if you want to sort of follow along and get your, your greatest 11 in in the comments, they have to have played during the era 1992 to 2002, and we'll certainly read out your greatest 11s at the end, and we'll come to that at the end of the show. But a wee bit of context, we'll start with the godfather of the podcast, Mr. Scott Kerr. You know, uh, I'm sure he remembers 1992 like it was yesterday, strolling to the school disco in his shell suit. Um, you know, that was the year in which Kevin McAllister was lost in New York. Uh, the Shaman had a number one single with Ebenezer Good, and you could get a golden cup in the local shop. How good a chocolate bar was that? But, that was my um, favourite one, David. Oh, it was mine as well, as you can tell. Was it, was it, was it, was it, uh, it was different gravy, Scott, different gravy. <laughs> so if we cast our minds back to 1992, in Channel 4, we're following Paul Gascoigne in his road to recovery at Lazio through rehabilitation. And they had started the chat um, with Lazio, actually, for the, the TV broadcast rights in their games. And uh, long story short... Serie A said to them, well, you can't have the rights to just the Lazio's game, but we'll sell you the full coverage uh, of the Serie A international broadcasting rights for $1.5 million. And if you put that into context right now, that wouldn't buy, buy you one of Cyril Odessa's legs in the current transfer window. So $1.5 million for the whole of uh, the Serie A broadcast rights was certainly some deal. And it was a show with a sort of different variety, you know, to the usual. Obviously, we were used to terrestrial coverage with Scott Sport. They had their sort of lunchtime show and then the Sunday show with a phone in. On BBC, they kind of had a Friday night magazine show with Friday night sports scene and then the highlights on a Saturday night. But this sort of had a, a different vibe care, you know, and it started off with, with none other than Paul Gascoigne hosting it. But out from the shadows came the producer, James Richardson, and he really stole the show going forward. He did, Jim. He never, he never done presenting before, by all accounts. Yeah, I remember him saying he never done that before, but he was quite knowledgeable about uh, European football, especially Italian football. But I know Gaz was meant to host it, but I think for various reasons, he failed to turn up a few occasions, didn't he? I don't think he just went evil, as Gaz usually did back then. But it was new to everybody. And we, I think quite a lot of people just suddenly tuned in and started late in Italian football because back then it was probably the best league to watch because the English pretty much up in like what it's nowadays. It wasn't full of money. 
it was called obviously the first division back then, but I think it was a year after I went to English Premiership in ninety three, but it was just something different, wasn't it? And it was I think it was just a joy to watch seeing all these players we've only maybe heard of or seen highlights of or buying VHS tapes and stuff like that. So it was great to see them all watch it for a different reason. When I started watching it, it was just for the players. Some of the players' names you heard, especially watching the World Cup and stuff, you really like to watch this for this guy and that guy. And then the more you watch it, then you start to like maybe one or two teams, you know what I mean? So it's living. So all we do, we watch football and then you know, it's different leagues, we pick a team you like. Any sport you end up picking a team you like. So no, it was really good. I really enjoyed it. I know the Titan Channel 5 tried to bring it back, didn't they? But it didn't even last that long. But no, it was good back then because it was something different because we didn't have all the TV channels we had just to have this now. And Brian, if we think about it, uh, 1992, you know, the, the coverage, uh, you know, football, it, it sort of spiked after a, a Italia 90, I felt, in terms of, you know, how broadcasters started to package it. I thought that the intro to Italia 90 uh, on the BBC, where they had uh, Pavarotti and Nesson Dorma, Everybody just sort of got the vibe of how to broadcast football differently. And, and broadcasters started to take it a bit more seriously than they did with sort of saying in grievancy before, where it was sort of, you know, more sort of comical. It, it then became sort of more an entertainment industry and, and packaged as such. And I think under the stewardship of James Richardson and the commentary of Peter Brackley, Channel 4 and their Serie A coverage certainly nailed it. They certainly did. Um, and I always enjoyed James Richardson sitting outside some suave cafe with a, a a coffee with all the papers spread over. And he'd read the headline in Italian, then explain what it meant in English. Um, and he'd read the sort of rumours and the stuff that's happened in the week previous. So, yeah, James Richardson was a, a tremendous host. Um, he got the, the sort of lead up to the game on the Saturday and then the Sunday was the live game. And as, as you know, live games back then were... Cup finals and pretty much, you know, maybe a semi final, a push, and that was it. So, the, the very thought of watching live games, league games, was alien. Everybody was just sort of bes- totally, uh, sort of bespoke, uh, bewitched by it, and everybody just sort of fell in love. I mean, I was 14 at the time when it started, and as, as you can imagine, a 14 year old uh, teenager watching Italian football, it was just, oh, I couldn't get enough of it. My, my life at the weekend revolved around it. I watched the Saturday show, and then I was I made sure I was home on the Sunday to watch the the live game of whoever it was, and that was life back then. It was just get home for the Saturday show, and then well, watch the live game on the Sunday. And Robert, I don't know if it, what it was like in your house, but me and you were born in the same year. But um, a Sunday morning, the longest two hours of the day for me was when Little House of the Prairie or the Waltons was on, and then Rawhide was on after it, waiting on football. I tell you, come on. Honestly, it was enduring. And your mum always got a show to the telly back then before your dad got the Fitba for the rest of the day. Listen, I'm much like Ker in the sense that it was the it was the window into European football for me. I'd um, you know me and my cousin used to collect football stickers and you know Euro '96 in, in particular. And then you, I'd go down to his house at the weekends and we'd lie in front of the telly and just as Kerr said, fall in love with all these names, which I'm sure we're going to talk about later on. But I think it's important to say that it was probably the first football show that you saw with the it was an English sort of presenter, but he was speaking the, the, the fluent tongue. Um, which I think sort of sealed the deal for them, by the way, when they went over there. I think when they were trying to negotiate that deal, the bigger clubs weren't so keen um, on maybe it just being English sort of coverage. But the fact that James Richardson spoke the language and he was hosting all the interviews in Italian sort of blew it up. And as you say, you, you just sort of fell in love with it. It became cult and you, you sort of took it for granted in a sense. But um, no, it was, uh, as I say, first look into European football before phones and the internet, and you just you, every weekend falling in love with stadiums and jerseys and players. And a bit like here, never had a club, um, just loved the football. And then we'd, we'd watch the game on the Sunday. As soon as it was finished, out with our football on the street, and we were Viali or Ravanelli or Edgar Davids or, you know, whoever it was. So, um, no, fond, fond memories. And Kerr, if we think about the coverage, I think what talked it off as well is, you know, James Richardson was a fantastic host, but Peter Brackley on commentary absolutely nailed it. And obviously things were a bit different back then. The commentary was done live from a, a wee TV studio 
in London, you know, but he's broadcasting and telling the story as if he's actually at the game. And more often than not, he seemed to be joined by, by Ray Wilkins in the commentary box. And the two of them had a sort of great rapport and they sort of made you feel comfortable viewing it and uh, very knowledgeable. And it, it was, you know, part of the package. It, it made for great viewing. It was because we never really had anything like that previous, do you know what I mean? So you had obviously Peter Brightley, you had Ray Wilkins, but I you and you had Joe Jordan at times, and you also had Paul Elliott at times. So the various eight players who maybe played over there as well. Uh, so it was good and it was just good to watch. Listen, not every game was great. I mean, I can't remember most of the games because it was so long ago, but it's like I said earlier, it opened your eyes to all these guys you've never heard of otherwise, because some of them were household names, not only, but never really made it across here because there wasn't such things as satellite telly or internet back then there was certain things you could do but it was a lot of hard done so like, you were buying maybe shoot magazine and stuff like that or football stuff and but this came along and it opened your eyes to other football because obviously we just went to watch football up in Scotland but then this came along and you thought these guys are just different class compared to what maybe some of the players are watching here Obviously, now you can see games for everywhere. No matter where you are in the world, you can watch a game because of satellite TV. But that's what made it so good because we didn't have that option. So this was really, you said, we were excited to watch it. We were waiting to watch it. We were, especially the two shows a week. The highlight program is class because you just get to see every goals and watching goals for every game is really good because the Italian football back then was good. But there was a lot of goals. Everybody always always say Italian defences, but there was also a lot of goals in these games. And the, 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 the situation, even the, the first time you've probably seen, like, they introduced you to defend the ultras because they had them back there then. Do you know what I mean? So how the fans come on to the stadium, how they done displays and stuff like that. So it was different. And it was just really good to watch. I remember it, watching it all the time and thinking, I want to go to an Italian game of football. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Glad I did, but eventually managed to. But it's just... Back then we were younger and it was just, it was great to watch and then you go out in the afternoon and go to iBox or whatever, but listen, it was great because it just done we never had previously, apart from you, even the, even the computer folk, uh, computer wise, you had maybe football manager, but it was like stick, stick guys, wasn't it? I mean, remember that day we stick men playing football manager, not like what Robert plays now, it's like the 4D stuff, but no, it was really good and I say, the guys who presented the show were superb, so they were doing a fantastic job and and the Italian language is just sexy. <laughs> I can't disagree there. <laughs> you caught me off guard with that one. Post watershed or pre watershed. Um, <laughs> but Kerr um, <laughs> makes some great points there, Brian. I mean, Italian football, you know, from probably the people who don't watch it, was often sort of, you know, hit with the tag, you know, that it was defensive football first. But if we go back to the very first season, which was 92-93, the first game started with a 3 each draw between Lazio and Sampdoria. And then if you think about it, in the same season, we had a 7-1, a 7-3, a 5-4, a 5-3. I mean, it really was the league that had it all. And at that time, you have to say, it had all the best players in the world in that league. It certainly was. If you were a footballer of any stature, Italy was the destination. It was as simple as that. Um, you know, I mean, you, you just look at the likes of Van Basten, uh, Hulett, Rijkaard, you know, all those sort of guys. I mean, that's just a hundred of the guys that were there. Um, it was just the place to be. And uh, I, I think because they had so much attacking sort of a... Uh, talent on show, it was impossible not for goals to happen. Um, you know, there was laterally Papan went to Milan. Um, you know, guys, you know, it was just littered with world-class players. And if you were, as I say, any, if you want to accomplish anything in your football career, a move to Italy was top of the tree. And it was just, it was so good to watch. As you say, the first game ever was 3-3 Sampdoria, eh, Lazio at Genoa. The Genoa Stadium. So I mean, yeah, it was, it was just great, and it was so fresh. It was so new. Um, it was, it was the first time you'd seen any sort of league outside of uh, the UK, um, and it was, it was just transfixed. Everybody was transfixed by it, and 
as you say, it got it, it, Italian football did get a tag of being boring and sort of you know defensive. I mean, the only team you could say that was utterly outstanding at sort of defending during that era was the old Milan sort of team. You know that that centre back and the goalie goalkeeper were just sensational. So, but it was it was a great time. To, you know, watch fantastic football, watch the best talent in the world, and it was just it was just uh, the place to be. Simple as that. And Robert, obviously Italian football being Italian football, it's not without its uh, controversies. And I remember a broadcast in 95 where Milan were playing Genoa. And, and obviously during the first half of that game, I'm sure, you know, some of you will be aware what happened. Maybe some of your younger viewers watching won't. But back in the day before there was social media, there was such a thing as teletext or CFAX, and that's where you got your information. That was the original Gillette Soccer Saturday, where you used to watch a text, video print version on your telly, and that's how you watch your coupon coming in. Uh, but back then, as they were doing the live broadcast of that milan Genoa game, obviously there, there was a fan murdered in the first half of that game, and, and they weren't able to communicate that going on, it, and you didn't find that out the, after the game, and you know... That that you know that's just how it was back in the day. Unfortunately, Italian fans even to this day still have that sort of tag where you know they've got the intimidation factor. It, 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 you know, there's still UEFA warnings about travelling to certain games, and that was very much the culture, certainly in the early to mid nineties. Well, you listen now to, to people that go to Italian grounds in this day and age, and it's a, a full on passport check before you get into the ground, and it's really high security, so that's probably stemming from that, and I do think maybe laterally that's what maybe killed Italian football was the controversy, we will talk about maybe match fixing and, and things like that, but just taking back to, to what Brian was talking about and I actually think that if, if Italian football in the 90s was the blueprint for what we have for modern day football, in the sense that the way the players were living their life off the pitch as well as on it um, they had these spa-like body um, training grounds that had never been seen before. You know, English clubs and, and, and you know Rangers even training in parks and stuff. You know, apparently Milan's was like a was like a you know a five-star resort. Um, so these guys, as I say, probably set the standard um, in terms of the whole of Europe. Um, and you know, we had it was no coincidence you had football, you had the, sorry Italian ninety, and then the likes of I mean, Platt. I think yeah, he went over there, didn't he? Gaz obviously goes over there. I mean, I think Des Walker might have had a spell in, in Italy as well. So you, you saw that influx. And then, you know, I always remember David Platt and that, that Sampdoria shot looking splendid. Um, really, again, just more iconic set of features. So I, I think, as I say, football Italia was the, was the was the flagship for modern day football as we, as we know it now. And obviously you can see that the threes are wearing resplendent uh, retro jerseys from uh, that period of football Italia. So... Kerr, I'm going to come to you first. Please explain to the viewers at home what top it is you're wearing. And also, if you can hit me with what your sort of favourite tops of the era were. You know, there was some garish, really garish Italian strips back in the day. I remember uh, Claudio Taffarel was uh, the Regiana goalkeeper. And if you go and Google that goalie top, honestly, it was absolutely horrendous. So, Kerr, any favourite jersey you you of the era? I would just, I like the plain jerseys more. That's what I'm wearing now is the Roma one for 2001, 2002, and it's a European jersey. I never really wore it, and I like it was obviously just for Europe, but I like the Adidas stuff. I like the Adidas Roma ones. I like, I always thought Juventus was just class because it's just an old, the old fashioned Juventus. Every season it's the same thing, but the Milan and Inter Milan's were good as well. But I used to like stuff like Barry, Udinese, because they brought up different stuff. and it was just different seeing all these different jerseys, but I like I always like Adidas kits more for some reason. I still probably do it to this day. I just think Adidas produced the best gear. But I remember the Kappa ones come in as well, and they were very tight fitting and all the players, weren't they? Okay. But Italian teams, even the, 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 the Italian national side, they, all, they would always look class with what they dress in and compared to maybe back then to other countries, but obviously it's kind of different now. But the jerseys were just different. You Kappa, you, you had Joma, I think, was out very early over there as well, and you had Adidas. I can't remember seeing much night jerseys, but I could be wrong. But it's Lotto that like Brian was wearing, I was an Italian make as well. So all Italian mates we never heard of because it was just really Adidas, a night in, um, Adidas night in Umbro weekend that we had over here, but you seen different makes over there, didn't you? Spell like Kappa and 
lot over and then you start to see guys wearing their football boots and as a kid wearing face even different football boots. So well obviously we're all kind of just black boots anyway back then, but it was just different, you know, with tops and Lazio's tops were always good as well. And I'm sitting here with Roma top one, I'm praising Lazio. Do you know what I mean? Don't get that over, don't get that over on Rome Day. <laughs> but no, the the top I just like like the football tops, Davy and the more unusual, the better for me. But I, like I say, I used to just prefer the plain ones, but I always go for ones that maybe, that maybe no, no many people have, just so I can keep them and then either sell them later on or hand them down or whoever. But uh, I just like collecting like football stuff, so and this is one of the ones I've got. Well, Brian, my favourite jersey is the away version of the top that you're using, and it's the Fiorentina 92-93 away strip. I mean, it is just a sheer class strip. I, I, my early memories of it are Brian Loudrop wearing it, you know, and before Brian Loudrop signed for Rangers. Um, so what, what about yourself? Obviously, I, I know you're sort of partial to AC Milan, sort of late 80s and early 90s, but that's certainly a resplendent strip that you're bearing tonight. Yeah, well, I one of my first games I actually watched, well, I obviously watched the very first game, but one of the first live sort of games I watched was obviously a Fiorentina game and obviously a certain Gabriel Batistuta was playing and I think, I can't remember what the, he scored, I think, or certainly, you know, played well in that game and I kind of just homed in in Fiorentina. It was an unusual kit, purple. Not many teams had purple, so that was a kit that I, that was a sort of club that I just sort of homed in on. I loved Batistuta. I watched him and fell in love with him. And for then, that was my team. But I mean, you go back to the sort of the AC Milan strips, um, you know, the Opal and Mota and um, was it Mello? Can't remember the long name they had when Van Basten played the long. Eh? Is that Mizuno? No. No, it wasn't Mizuno. It was Milan. Oh, I would have to look it up. But there was a long name and tops like that. And then. As, as Kerr was saying, you had Kappa, Lotto, you know, it was just tremendous. And they were always thinking out of the box, as he says. They weren't scared to push the the boundary in, in the sense of the style of the kit or whatever. As long as I had the club colours, I don't think the fans really cared too much about, you know, the style. Um, again, Juventus took their strip from Notts County, I believe, when they played them in a, a friendly. So things like that. And then you go into sort of like the... Is, uh, Robert was saying earlier that Sam Doria shirt, the ERG on the front, very iconic sponsor, um, just stuff like that. And you were, for me, I was totally bewitched by the kits. I loved them, um, and they were just some tremendous. And the only one I really didn't sort of like or care for was the the end of Milan one, purely because it was always black and red stripes, and they they very really changed the sponsors because they were Pirelli for a long time, and a Fibar, I think it was the other one. They were they were very reluctant to change in sponsors and everything. So that, that was the only kit I wasn't really fussed about. The Parma one, well, Parma kits were absolutely first class. So, you know, it was just a great time to be a, a, a fan buying these shirts. And even the kit makers must have had lots of fun making them. I think you might end up black and blue, uh, Brian, if you tell an Inter fan that you had a black and red top. Uh, wow. But... Um, <laughs> but no, you touch on some great points. Uh, for me, I love the, the Sampdoria 93-94 uh, home strip, the Asics were. I thought it was great. With, obviously, Rude Hulett signed and, you know, they were making a move to try and, you know, challenge for the title. And, and for me, it's one of my earliest memories. I loved watching that side play football. They were a great, great side to watch. You know, in terms of the latter years, uh, Inter Milan had a third top that was very similar to, you know, the Rangers um, away kit that uh, Gabriel Gabriel Amato scored a, a hat trick up at um, Pataudry. You know, the white with the blue and then the light blue. Inter Milan had a, a top like that, three shades of blue, which might, you know, be a, a funny name for an adult movie, perhaps, but certainly that was the third kit at that time. <laughs> I'm going on Doogie Vipod on these now, uh, but certainly, you know, the 94-95 Juventus away strip with the blue and yellow, the Kappa one, I, I remember Del Piero in that strip, Viale, Ravinelli, that for me was just you know, the quintessential kit back in the day that everybody wanted, that you could never get a hold day. You had to go into Greaves and wait six weeks for it to come. You know, it was a different life back then. Now they've got them all to hand. But, Robert, for you, 
any favourites? You're sporting a very, you know, Batistuta-esque strip you know, there, shall we say? I think for me, it's more the shirts remind me of players, Davey, rather than, you know, the, the, the period of a club. You've just said there. As soon as somebody sees a Fiorentina shirt of that era, they think a Batistuta, right? I know Brian might not like me here, but the Inter 95-96, it's Ronaldo um, for me as well. You've got the, the Parma, it's Hernan Crespo. I also love the, the Euro 96 Italy top, the night one. Now, I know um, Kerry was saying there are not many were, were night, but I also remember this shot of Paolo Maldini in the full night tracky with the 95s on, um, just looking absolutely gallus. So, I literally, the, the, the kits were just, as I say, um, pinned to players. And it was the first time for me that I'd seen the, you know, the, the number and name sets I was wowed by that. I always thought they looked absolutely stunning. I always remember seeing uh, when you remember Nakata when he was at Parma, wasn't he? Um, remember that one stinks out in my mind as well. So, oh, it was uh, the shirts are iconic as you say. I don't think they make them like these anymore, to be brutally honest. Uh, in terms of um, the design and the collars and the, the wee buttons on, you know, I think we go through shirts uh, to a penny these days. But the, the, some of the Italian stuff and the, even the, the British stuff of the nineties is, is just goes down in, in history. A care, obviously, something that sort of goes hand in hand with Italian football is the stadiums. And, and some of the stadia, you know, hasn't changed much from, from back then. There's obviously a lot of talk just now about, you know, certain iconic stadiums, you know, getting replaced and, and no longer going to be there. But for me, I'm going to be slightly controversial here in the fact that the one thing that I sort of hold a sort of grudge against Italian stadiums for is, when it came to Italia 90, a lot of them built that running track in round the side of the ground. And for me, as a football fan, my favourite thing for a stadium is a compact stadium where you're right in top of the pitch. And for me, my two favourite stadiums in Italy for that reason are Fiorentina's and Genoa's because, you know, especially Genoa's, it looks like a castle for the outside, but inside, you know, it, it's so steep. You know, even though it's two tiers and it goes sort of di diagonally back, but they're right on top of the fans. And, and for me, that, that makes for a classic atmosphere, which Italy was renowned for in the 90s. It was, but I think even like you see the big city, a lot of the clubs share the stadium just because it helps them financially. And it's, I don't know if it's the, the city on the stadium or the parent, or I don't know where it works, but Milan, the two Milan teams share, the two teams in Rome share. So I think the... I don't know if the fans enjoy it, but I think the teams do, like I said, they've not got a lot of time to keep their stadiums updated. The, the Olympic Stadium is quite old. In Rome, Milan, the San Siro is the same. It's quite old. And I mean, watching the, the Gazette of Football back then, because Italian 90 is no long been, you recognise all the stadiums you're watching against the, the, because the World Cup was on a couple of years earlier. And the stadiums, some of the stadiums probably do need upgrades, especially for security reasons and other ways. But I don't know if you remember watching some of the games back then. I mean, some of the some of the things took into the games. I remember watching a Rome Derby one, and I don't even know what year it was. But I don't know what set of fans it was, but they had a motorbike in. But they managed to chuck the motorbike into the set of fans. Do you know that way? It's like, why did you, how did you manage to get a motorbike into a football stadium? It, they were just, it was just nuts. And, you know, okay, I've been in the San Siro Stadium, so I know what it's like. But, and it would be a shame if it gets torn down. But to be honest with you, it's not, it's not the greatest. It looks, it's, a, it's a bit like the Barcelona Stadium for me. When you're in it, it's, when you see it from outside or your TV, it looks great. But when you're inside it, it needs a lot of work done to it. So sometimes the better tearing down and starting again, you've seen how much they've done it in this country. And I think maybe half to do over there as well, but everything costs money. But listen, if the teams are sharing the stadium and the city's paying for a lot of it as well, it will save them money because they're not having to put the ball themselves. But it's just the way football is going. You have to move the times, and some of these stadiums are quite old now. And but we remember them because of the World Cup. And I think well, it doesn't matter where the World Cup. I always remember some stadiums from the World, watch the World Cup because everybody watches that. No matter if you're a big football fan or not, you watch World Cup because if your country qualifies. And Brian, you're sort of the connoisseur of that sort of era of Italian football. What about you? Have you visited any of the the stadiums uh, from way back then? And about yourself, you you get any particular favourites? I've been lucky enough to be to two. I went to Milan to watch Inter versus Torino. Um, obviously, with being at Milan, it was just a potluck weekend. We went and 
obviously with them both playing there, you 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 were getting a game. You just couldn't, you didn't know which one, and it was Inter versus Torino. So that was brilliant. Only thing is, as Kerr says, it's a tired stadium. The inside's not very good. Basically, all they've got is plastic seating that you sit on, and there's no backs. It's it's very very basic. Um, but it was the first time I was introduced to a sort of capo where there's a guy with a megaphone and he's just telling the fans what to sing. And I was like, what's going on here? And uh, somebody sitting next to me says, oh, that, that guy tells them what to sing. And I was like, oh, I, that was a new, totally new thing to me. And then I went over to Florence to watch Fiorentina as well against Empoli, which was a 2-2 draw. Um, fantastic little stadium, but they're building a new one, which is going to be unbelievable. Um, but the current one just now, the the uh, Artemo Franchi's another one that's just very tired looking. But I mean, the new Juventus one now is is tremendous. You know, the one that they had before was the the Olymp the the Stadio del Alpi, and it was again a fabulous nostalgic stadium, but very tired looking. I think I always liked the the Sampdoria Genoa stadium because it was quite compact, it was quite tight, and it always generated a, fa a fabulous atmosphere. So if I was going for my favourite one, I would say it was the Sampdoria Genoa one, just purely for the, the compactness and the, the style of it. It was very Ibrox-like. And Robert, yourself, a man in my era, so you should have a, a sort of few uh, uh, under your belt, I would imagine. Well, no, listen, I, I, I thought we'd all just very pumped for one and we've all sort of pumped for the same and Brian's just literally stole every bullet point I've made about that <laughs> on, my, on my piece of paper there. So I was going to say, rem reminiscent of Ibrooks, I like the brickwork. Um, I, it was, uh, see, see these new grounds and how fantastic they are in terms of facilities. Like, you know, I, I, I'm all for that and that, that needs to happen. But I do think you need to try and incorporate some of the, the, the old infrastructure and, and you know, that as I say, those um, you you said it they look like a castle to you, and that's a, a really good point. Um, I always thought it would be a, a, a cracking wee sort of scale retro, you know, Lego model <laughs> that one because it's got the, the brickwork now the corners. But for me, I'm sorry to be boring, Davy, but um, Sampdoria Genoa just for me, as I say, it, it just has something about it, um, traditional, um, and I think you know it's, it's something that you wouldn't want to part with too soon for you know like a, 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 a Tottenham or a Juventus. Yeah, so just to remind everybody in the comments, you know, towards the end of the podcast, we're sort of at the halfway point. Uh, we're all going to be picking our greatest 11 from the era, 92 to 2002. And the rule is you're allowed one player per club. So if you want to get your 11s in the chat, we'll certainly read the best ones out. We've also got a quiz on the way very, very soon that I have managed to fit in. And there is a few wee Rangers numbers in there as well. So that's just to keep everybody on their toes. But before we go to that, I think everybody knows what our greatest 11 is. And we've all spoke about the fact that there were so many great players. And the great players weren't just sort of, you know, through one part of the period. There was great players and it transitioned from 92, 93, and it just evolved. There, there seemed to be a continuous conveyor belt of talent. And all the best players all the way through the 90s still were going to this league right up until the end, you know. And, and, and for me, I think... It, it's an important thing to highlight is our honourable mentions. So the guys who have not made our greatest 11 that you would maybe perhaps like to pay tribute with. And Scott, I'm going to start with you. Can I stop fucking screen? I'm, I'm always first. Uh, listen's a lot of players I left out because I try to make it more Italians than I did anything, anything else. So I've left out guys like we've mentioned before, uh, David Platt. I've, I've left out a lot of guys who probably left. Uh, David Platt. I've left out. Uh, Ronaldo left him out. Del Piero left him out. Uh, Parisi left him out. Yeah, I've just so many guys. I mean, Brian Loudrop as well. Uh, didn't include him. Signore Phil actually didn't didn't include him. So there's a lot, especially Del Piero. That was a hard one for me because I remember my against Rangers a few times and it totally. He totally destroyed us just himself, and he was that good a player. And I'm gutted I couldn't include Maradona because he's my favourite player ever. But he just left that early before this all kicked off because like, he was then not chased out of the mafia. But because he'd, he'd, be, he'd have been in the team himself, he was that good. But there's so many players. Like I said, I try to make it because you said one player per team, and I try to make it most Italian guys so I left out a lot of the foreign players, even like players like Bear Camp as well. I've got Dennis Bear Camp is there and 
run past and just a lot of foreigners I left out that played Natalie just because I try to make it more of a challenge. I've got one or two, I think I've got maybe two, no, one or two foreigners, depending. I've still, my left wing spot, my left midfield spot, what do you call it? I've still got a couple of guys, I don't know who to pick because I let I say to go, but hell yeah, I've done this in work the other day, then I left it in the work, so I've had to kind of try and remember who I put down, so I'm putting guys in, I don't even know if it was in my list, I'll probably check it in the morning, but it's too late, so there's a lot of players I left out. You're trying to think back, and the more I can think back, it's, Either late end it or early. In the middle, I'm struggling. So um, I had to use Google a wee bit, but I didn't want to use it because I wanted to just remember the players I remember. So I'm trying to do it that way. So, and then you know yourself, you're thinking of one guy and you think of Milan's team, you could probably put the field Milan team in or UV team in because they won so many titles and people don't want to do that either. So you're good going guys to say, right, he's probably a five Italian team between that 10 years. I can maybe put him in and use that club. So that's kind of what I've done. No, you, you make a great point there. I mean, for me, I left out Zidane, who's my favourite player of all time, you know. I, but I just link Zidane more to the fact when I was picking my team, I decided longevity, as in Serie A longevity, that's what I decided to go with. So, I, you know, I might be affected by recency bias, as I'm sure we all are to a degree. But Marcel Desai is a player that I left out because... When he was in Italy, he sort of played more as a holding midfielder. And for me, I thought his best position was centre-half. And that's why I've left him out. Um, I've left out Cafu, who's arguably one of the greatest wing-backs of all time. I've left out R9, sorry, Aldo, guilty as well, you know. I've left him out as well. And the one player who I really struggled with not putting in because I think he had longevity, I think, you know, he won everything that you could win in Italy, was Pavel Nedved. You know, I thought he was a, a terrifically gifted footballer, very cultured, you know, predominantly left-footed, and I always think left-footers look easier on the eye. And for me, you know, he was sort of, you know, the player of that area, Lazio, and then into Juventus. For me, he's synonymous with, with football Italia. He, you know, he's one of the first guys that come to mind, that springs to mind for me. So, that was the ones I really struggled with. What about you, Brian? Did you struggle with, you know, not fitting anybody into your team? Oh, the, this was honestly a three or four day mission doing this. Um, I've left out the likes of Rijkaard, uh, Van Basten, Hulet, um, Lillian Turam at Parma, then obviously Juventus. Um, it was just so difficult. Um, you know, the, I didn't put R9 in as well, so... Uh, I couldn't squeeze him in because there was just, for me, better player, well, better at the time. I've went, as you say, nostalgia and longevity in CDR. So for me, I, I went for other players at Inter and uh, Milan. Um, but yeah, there was the Lazio teams, you know, there were so many good players that played then. Uh, Paul Yuka, the goalkeeper at Sampdoria. Uh, Peruzzi at Juventus. You know, there were so many... Like, it didn't have to be, like, the, the guy that scored 20, 30 goals. It's like, goalkeepers were... Peruzzi, I remember, being when he was playing, was almost like a wall for Juventus. He was almost like their Gorham to us. He was, he was just an, almost impossible to get past. Francesco Toldo, another goalkeeper, you know. it's It was so, so difficult. And, yeah, I, I, I as I say, I picked one guy, and then I, I would scroll a team and go, oh, he played for them, I'm like, no, and then uh, then I'd be in a dilemma for a few hours, and then it would just be torture. But yeah, the very difficult. And I must admit, my when I look at my team, I'm very happy with it. But it took three or four days to get there. It was an absolute mission. No, when you mentioned Angelo Peruzzi there, you remember me, or you reminded me rather of an incident. I think it was when uh, Foggia beat uh, Juventus two 0 and Peruzzi conceded the, the ghost goal, the goal that never went in and, and the referee gave it. And it's reminiscent of an incident where Andy Gorham saved one of his backside on the line at Putaudry against Aberdeen and he just sort of turned around and spun on it. Peruzzi done the exact same thing, yet the linesman ran to the halfway line and gave the goal. If, you, if you've got any spare minutes, YouTube it, it's a classic. If only VAR was involved in football back then, you know, obviously it might have sorted some of the Italian controversies out. Uh, but Robert, what about you? Obviously, 
you, you're a man that knows talent when I see it, I suspect, especially with teeth like that. So I take it that <laughs> you've got a, a few that you've struggled with no fitting in your team. Listen, I just want to say as well, when Angelo puts he's listening to this back and Spotify them on the morning, he's committed to work. That's the biggest compliment he's ever going to get in his career, that he was like Andy Gorham, you know, because that's absolutely spot on for, for Big Brian. Um, listen, I, I left out a, a, a couple of absolute, you know, worldies, to be fair. Roberto Carlos, uh, um, when he was at Inter. Um, Javi Zanetti on the other side, who I think you, you talk about longevity and, you know, that man just epitomises that club. One club. One, one club career for, for Javi Zanetti, lifted many, many trophies. I think he led them to European glory as well. An absolute player. Um, Del Piero, yeah, Totti. George Weir, I left out George Weir, former World Player of the Year, left him out. Couldn't get him in. Tino Aspria, he was he was omitted. Franco Zola, Di Matteo, nowhere near it. Uh, Casaraghi, another one I had to leave out. Um, and, and Luca Viali as well. Um, you know, so as you see, it was a very, very difficult task. Um, coming up with this team, I, I get my, my numbers down quite quite quickly. I must say, the the hardest bit was finding the loopholes of where they'd been on loan to earlier on in their career to try and shoehorn them in. Um, however, it's been listen. I'm sure the punters have, have seen it watching. We're all buzzing talking about this tonight. Well, it wanes in a sweetie show. It's been uh, a great idea, Dave, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So I can't wait to unleash my living, and I'm sure um, they're going to give either of you threes a, a game. No, I appreciate your kind words after the, the cheap dig for me, mate. So thanks very much. Uh, no, that was just a filler, obviously. You know, as presenters know what that is, Robert. <laughs> so here, here we are then. If everybody wants to get involved in the comments, we're going to go quiz time here. And, and Robert, this time I'm going to start with you, not to, you know, put care. Um, you know, first we'll, we'll go Robert, Brian, and then care last. So, so how, how I guess, this, baby? Five questions each, right? And ten seconds to answer. Just sort well, the of the same quick... questions or no, no, different questions each. So right. I've got five separate questions for each of you. If you want to get involved in the comments, there'll be 15 questions in total. So mark yourself out at 15 come the end, and we'll obviously highlight the best scores. So, Robert, I'm gonna start with you. So Question they, number they one they for your But these two have to get Radio Rome in their ears so they can listen to it while I get my, my questions on. Um, <laughs> no, no. I'm just got I'll go I'll go you question one, Brian question one, care question one, oh, and then I, so I, on, okay. and then just best it for <laughs> if there is a tiebreaker, we have a tiebreaker. Okay. So question one, here we go. The first football Italian match broadcast live on Channel 4 featured a 3-3 draw between Sampdoria and Lazio. But which former international teammate of Terry Butcher and Chris Woods played in the match? Uh, I'll say Ray Wilkins. Unfortunately, that is not correct. Brian, Brian, do we know the answer there? David Platt. David Platt. We've been talking about it's David Platt. Incorrect as well. Oh, it's not right. Not David Platt. No, nope. Trevor Francis. Incorrect as well. The answer was Des Walker. Are you against them, Robert? As well. So, Brian, that. we'll go with your first question mm -hmm. here. Um, so, in the following sequence, I'm going to give you three main city rival derbies. Who played in these in this order from first to last? So, the Lisbon derby, the Rome derby. And then the old firm derby. Portuguese, Rome, old firm. That's your answer. Oh, God. Blame me. Oh. Let's make me quick fire, Brian. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm lost there. So you... you he played in Portuguese derby, Rome derby. No, nah. totally went blank. Anybody get any guesses? Well, somebody in the comments it says Claudio Canidia. It was actually Jonas Telm. Oh, wow. Oh, fuck. I would have been here to the phone in trying to get that. <laughs> Kia, I've got well, a 50 I think the questions were easy. Kia, no, I've got easy. 50. Care, I've got a 50-50 question for you. Former Ranger Paolo Vinoli is probably best remembered for his goal at Ibrox against Dundee. But did he make more league appearances in Serie A or Serie B? 
Sorry, B. Is unfortunately incorrect. <laughs> it is Syria. Total it was 100, 135 in Syria and 130 in Syria B. So it was Total very trick question. Uh, Robert, oh, then B because it's yeah. <laughs> obvious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which former Ranger signing has scored the most Serie A league goals? So this person has signed for Rangers but he has the most Serie A league goals of every player Rangers have signed from the Italian league. It's difficult, isn't it? No, I can't even have a stab at it. Um, I'm... Marco Negri. It's a fair enough guess, but uh, unfortunately, it's incorrect. Brian Kerr. Mark Brian. Yately. Who? Mark Yately. No, no. It's actually People Maniero. I believe Buffalo, Buffalo Alberts got the correct. So People oh. Maniero actually signed for he Rangers. Never for us, no, but that wasn't the question. It was who signed <laughs> for Rangers. So, uh, was, what, what year was that? So that would have been 2005, 2006. The, the year signed Franny Jervis, Jeffers, yeah. and we got to the, the last 16 in the Champions League. He signed in pre-season and then left left the week before the season started. So he was there for three weeks. How many goals did he scored in Serie A for who? It's a 78 in total. All right, for, for a couple so of clubs, right? A few clubs, aye. He was a sort of journeyman, Brian, eh? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, Brian, I'm going to come to you with this one. Milan won the title season 1993-1994. But how many league goals did they score? It was almost as many games as they played. I reckon it was... If I remember rightly, it was. I, I think it's in the low forties, high thirties. Um, how many how many games did they play in the season? So there's eighteen teams in the league. Times that by two. Thirty six. I'm going to say thirty nine or four, four, 41. The correct answer is thirty six. Oh. So it was a goal game. Thirty no thirty four games they played though, wouldn't it? Oh, thirty four. Aye, aye. I knew it was low. I knew it was I know, low. I you're unlucky in that. Low. I kind of feel like giving you a point there, but we'll see how it comes come the end. Oh, uh, <laughs> Kea, Kea, it's never, no plot all over. Kea, Ronaldo made his league debut for Inter in 1997, but he was overshadowed in the game by a fellow debutant. Can you name the fellow South American who scored two goals in the same game? No, no, I can't, I can't even think. Brian, you want to jump in? Zamorano? Zamorano. I'll, I'll go, I don't know, it's too early for him, actually. I'll, I'll say Rakoba. Is the correct answer, my friend. <laughs> Tremendous. I thought it was too early for Rakoba. I, I did, can I, but no. So he, it was his debut at the same time as well. He, I share my birthday with that man. Um... Was, the uh, game I watched didn't there, Torino, he scored. Oh, did he? He always goes well. He's that boy as well. He always goes for class. Yeah. Hey, Robert, I'm going to fire through these as quickly as I can now. So, Alessandro Del Piero made his league debut for Juventus in September 1993, coming on as a substitute for Fabrizio Ravinelli. But what was the number on the back of his jersey? In Italy, it could be absolutely anything. I'm, I'm going to say 14. <laughs> is, is that a... don't know what was coming through on his computer there. Oh, no. um, was it... Sorry, a wee bit of technical difficulties there. Was it, was, is it 14? Uh, uh, very close. It was 16, to be honest oh. with you. 
Ah, uh, so uh, uh, you know, unlucky there. I feel like giving you a point, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Brian, what league position did Milan finish in season 96 97? 10th. I read this the other day. Brian, you're going to kick yourself. It's 11th no. the following <laughs> season. You finished 10th. <laughs> Oh, it's like, I'm not winding these up. These are the you, correct answers. You, you knew they were, I knew they finished like way down. Oh, that's a fair, <laughs> that's a fair good kiss. Care, care, I've got to come to you here. So it's quick fire. 19 players have won the Ballon d'Or between 1987 and 2007. Only one of those players never played in Serie A. Who was it? Between what years? 1987 and 2007. Can I buzz in? Can I buzz in? I've Is got one. Spike I'll just say Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo. It's, it's McCoist. No, he won the Golden Ball, no, the Ballon d'Or. They're on the same thing. <laughs> 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 I that's what Michael Owen's one of them. Is the correct Owen. answer, Brian? Is oh, correct I, was answer? Say, I was going to say Michael Owen, but I didn't know he'd won the Ballon d'Or. He, won the, he won the Ballon d'Or with uh, Real Madrid. Aye. Right. There we go. I've, um, I've, learned, I've learned something new today that the Golden Boots know the Ballon d'Or. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Brian, if you don't get this one, you're as well going off the podcast. Which oh, car man? Back, you... back to me. Is it? Oh, I saw, I'm sorry, my apologies, Brian, my apologies. My last one. Uh, Robert, which car manufacturer sponsored Milan for 12 seasons between 94 and 2006? Car manufacturer? Give away. Ferrari? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't Brian. It's, awful. it's bloody awful. Ah, that's a correct answer. Oh, you're Enjoy. kicking yourself. Well, that was the easiest one ever. <laughs> you're scared to take your answer there. <laughs> oh, oh, my. oh my god! This is, this is how you must feel when you're on the chase. You know, in the pressure zone, <laughs> like, you can't even out your bank pin number because you're that. You know, oh. that's Brian. one of the most iconic sponsors you could ever get. <laughs> Brian, which striker did Juventus sign in 1992 to become a then world record transfer fee? Hmm. I'm not looking at the chat. Um... I'm going to say Viali from Sam Dory. That's the correct answer. Well done, Brian. Kia, in 1997-1998 season, which German international striker topped the Serie A goal-scoring charts? Bierhoff. Correct answer. It's a tiebreaker between these two. No, there's three questions left. Oh, right, so, right, okay. Robert, Buffon became the record holder of Serie A's Longest consecutive clean sheets, which was a total of 973 minutes. But whose record did he beat? Oh, I'm just going to stab in it. I'm going to say Paliuka. Is the incorrect answer, Brian? Do you want to guess? Sebastian Rossi. Is the correct answer? Was he, was he the Milan goalie? AC Milan. Yeah. Paul Conkin and Milan goalie. He was a, Brian, he wasn't actually that good a goalie, but it was just because the defense was so good. Brian, your last question: Who was the only non-Italian manager to win the Serie A title during the Football Italia years? Oh, non-Italian? Egg? No, no, they didn't. Non-Italian. I was gonna. No, they didn't, did they? Oh, 
Oh, super. I'm going to say Ericsson at Lazio. I know it's wrong, but it's only... It's the correct answer. Oh, yes. It was Spain Galli. And Kea, you need this to tie or Brian's a winner. In the first season of Serie A as broadcast on Channel 4, who finished league top scorer, the Coppa Italia top scorer, and won the Gerendoro, which is the Italian version of the Football Writers Player of the Year. Marco Van Basten. Is the wrong answer. Now, Marco Van Basten started the season brightly, but remember, that was the season where he picked up his injury and he missed five months of the season. So he scored 15 before he got injured, but then he didn't play the second half of the season. So the correct answer... Is that 91, 92, 93? 92, 93. I'm going to throw in Senori into that. Is the correct answer. So, Brian, you are the winner of tonight's podcast quiz. Well done. Give yourselves a round of applause. Some cracking answers in the comments as well. But now is the time, the reason why we're all here. It is the time for the greatest 11. So we were tasked this evening with picking the greatest 11 of the Serie A 92 to 2002 era. And this has been a difficult challenge. We've only been allowed one player per team. And Scott Kerr, I'm going to come to you tonight to kick things off and give us your Football Italia greatest 11. My keepers, Paluca. He was at Inter Milan, but he started at Bologna. So he's going, he's got him pinned in Bologna. Oh, oh, you went there. My right back, Sam Brota. Effie Barry, centre backs like Cannavaro for Parma and Nesta for Lazio. And it can only be one left back, it's Paolo Maldini. Uh, right mid, Zanetti, centre. Javier Zanetti, the person Robert left it. Shame. I know he's not Italian, but he sounds Italian, that's good enough. Uh, my centre mid is Roberto Baggio. Can you leave Baggio at his. Baggio to me is who are... What team you know, did you put Baggio to play for? Only one team, Juventus. Uh, next to him, Fisotto for Torino before he went to Juventus. <laughs> 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 and my left wing, this is the one I've kind of stuck. I've got three choices, so I'll come back to that. My number 10 is the only player that can be is Francesco Totti. Best player ever, Natalie. And up front, Batty Stutter. You can only be Batty Stutter for me. Can't be anybody else. So my left wing, a choice between Lentini for Atlanta. I know he went to Milan, but he had a bad car crash and stuff like that. Ruth Tullett, who could put it there because Ruth good enough. And Zola for Napoli. Ruth Tullett came for something Dora, by the way, from Milan. So I'll probably pick, because he was my first choice, I'm going to go with Lentini. And it's just the guys I like. There's not any day with longevity of a world class. No, it's just the guys I like watching the game. No, that, that's a strong 11. Be fitting in winning sort of any Serie A title, you would say. It would take a lot to, to certainly beat that team. Brian, can you top that? I'll try. Um, I've went for Buffon at Parma. Um, Buffon was just outstanding as a goalkeeper. Um, just tremendous. Can't say any more than that. Right back was Javier Zanetti of Inter. Um, longevity again, won everything at Inter. Um, club legend, um, just a tremendous fullback. Uh, my centre half pairing is Cannavaro when he was at Napoli. He started off at Napoli, played 50 odd games for them. So Cannavaro won a uh, Ballon d'Or. So um, can't leave him out. His partners. Easily, the, for me, the greatest centre-back of all time, Franco Baresi at AC Milan. I've, and as you can imagine, I've left out a hell of a lot of players to throw Baresi in, but for me, Baresi was just the, the definition of a centre-half sweeper. Um, nothing went past him, so he had to be in, and he, he would be the captain of this team also. My left-back, I struggled a little bit, but I plumped for Sinsa Mihailovic when he was at Sampdoria. Um, the wand of a left foot. Um, this guy could, if there was a bucket in the top corner, he would put it in the bucket every time. He was phenomenal. Uh, uh, maybe his, my, the only worry I would have is his discipline. He wasn't very good at that, but 
as far as a footballer, he could play. He actually laterally, I think, played sweeper um, for Lazio and stuff like that when Ericsson was there. So that was my defence. Zanetti, Baresi, Cannavaro, Mihailovic at left back. My midfield, I'll start off with Nedved when he was at Lazio. Lazio. Um, Nedved again started at Lazio when all that all conquering Lazio team at. Uh, with Ericsson, but obviously moved to Juventus and became a complete legend at Juventus. I think he was, did he win World Player of the Year as well? Or very close? I think he won Ballon d'Or. Uh, on the other, uh, I've only got a three-man midfield and three up front, so it's uh, Fr Francesco Totti in the, in, the, in the midfield as well at Roma. I mean, one club man, the definition of a, a total legend. He had many offers to move, but was always loyal to Roma, and I respect that. Um, that's that's tremendous loyalty. And the third the third midfielder I've went for is Zidane at Juventus. I've, I've failed to come up with another Juventus player that could play like him. Uh, I tried and tried. Um, uh, there was uh, Viali and uh, uh, sort of uh, Ravinelli and all those guys and the defenders, Ciro Ferreira, um, lots of great defenders, but I could not see passing that Zidane. It just was impossible. Uh, my third, my first striker, my first third, my first forward line man is Signori when he was at Bologna. Uh, Giuseppe Signori was the smallest, for one of the smallest forwards you'll ever get, but by God, he had a left foot on him and he could finish from anywhere. He was really, I, I was actually surprised that he didn't go to sort of more bigger clubs than sort of Lazio, because I think Lazio was probably the biggest team he went to, and I always found it amazing that I mean, a Juventus or an AC or an Inter never plumped for him, because he was always worth 20 goals a season, so I couldn't leave out Signori, um, and then my main number nine would be uh, Mr. Batistuta himself, Batigo. Um this guy was my absolute hero as a kid, I couldn't not leave him out, this guy was just, I mean some of the goals you'd see in YouTube nowadays, the goal against uh, Arsenal when he mazied past him at Wembley and th threw it in the top corner. I don't think David Seaman see, has seen that ball pass him to this day. Um, again, a guy that stayed at Juventus when he could have moved on a lot earlier, went to Roma Lazio and won the Scudetto with them. So, you know, he had a big say in that season. And the the sort of the curveball I'm going to throw at you is, is Bierhoff at U Udinese. Um, he started off at Udinese and obviously went to AC Milan. Um, Bierhoff, again, was a goal machine German striker. Just, again, a, a guy that was worth 20 goals a season. Um, so my front line was Signori, Batistuta and Bierhoff. Well, there's certainly plenty goals in that team without a question. Robert, uh, that is a hard task to sort of elevate that, but can you, 11, take that a step further? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I've went for a 3-4-3. A three, uh, starting off with, with, with Pali Wicca in goal um, under the guise of Sampdoria. I've then got a, a three of Maldini for Milan. Um, I've then we've got uh, Cannavaro at Napoli and Nesta of Lazio. I just think those three, you're, you're hard pushed. To, you know, if they were to say, if you say to them, show us your medals, that you'd be blinded more than you would be my teeth, David. There you are. All right. Um, the, the midfield. It's just it's full of class this midfield. So obviously Zidane, it's the it's the first time I'd seen a player, you know, um, sort of emulate a ballerina on a football pitch. This guy just oozed grace, class. I've never seen football played like this before. Um, you're watching him on the telly and just thinking, who is this guy and how is he doing that? Quite because quite a big man, by the way, Zinedine Zidane. It's not like he's a wee, you know, wee, a wee fairy kind of guy. He's a big guy, just moves so gracefully. So Zidane's in the middle with them. Um, Zivan your Boban, um, you know, I, I've got him, he start, they loaned him out to Barry, I think Barry went down that year, but he played really well and came back and done a decade at Milan, you don't do a decade at Milan if you're a poor player, I know he had some injuries in there, um, but I've, I've stuck in Boban because I just think, he, he. I always remember he had just that, it was almost like he was playing with a cigar in his mouth at times, Boban, so I've, I've got I've, I've got a, two really classy wide players, I've got wee Beppe Signore, um, as I say, you know, I've got him again under the guise of Bologna, which I think you know he was he was very formidable there. But his partnership at Lazio with Casaraghi was unbelievable. Some of the goals he would hit with the outside his boot, he had this knack of hitting with the outside his boot into the top 
you know, the roof of the net, it was incredible. And from distance as well, he was... We spoke before we came on here about Signore, and, and I just, he was the first name on my team sheet, by the way. He, a, a cult hero. Um, didn't get enough caps for Italy, as far as I'm concerned, but we spoke, as you say, David, before, and there was there was guys in front of him who were even more class. Um, and on the other side, I've put um, a man that was mentioned earlier on, Alvaro Ricoba. Um, under, he, he, had a, he had a loan spell at, at Venezia. I think he did manage to keep them up, I believe. Um, so oh, he, 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 he said that he's not having that. And then I was keeping my intercard close because you can't have a City A living without having Ronaldo in it. I'm sorry. Um, he, the Ronaldo, for me, was is the reason I fell in love with football. This guy was just incredible. Absolutely incredible. You think of that night they won the UEFA Cup on that park and he's sort of... The, the run, you talk about Batistuta with Maisie runs. Ronaldo, the ball was sort of glued to his foot. So it's Ronaldo. It is Batistuta. I think we've all got him in our front line, which is interesting. Uh, he's the one constant in all of this. And I've also chucked in Hernan Crespo because I just think, um, for Parma, I just think he was, uh, wherever he went, he scored goals. Um, he was one of them. You you know, you spoke of Beerhoff, and I think, you know, Beerhoff at Udinese in particular was incredible. But Crespo scored goals at Lazio, he scored goals at Parma. I know he came to Chelsea later on in his career and he'd he done all right there as well. So Hernan Crespo completes that 1 to 11. That's a very tasty team. I think my team is going to beat the lot of yours. But before that, uh, I'm going to give a special mention to James. As you know, guys, James has been very supportive of this particular podcast and it would be remiss of me not to weed out his team. James has slightly misskewed the question, though, because uh, oh, this should have been 92 to 2002 year, but he's picked for one of his players was outside Milan in 1984, and I think that's where he's got a bit mixed up. But barn that, all the other sort of uh, 10 that are in the team are, are fine. So he's gone Buffon at Parma, he's went Zanetti at Inter, Maldini at Milan, Costa Cutter at Monza, and Fabio Cannavaro at Napoli. He's went Mancini at Sampdoria, Baggio at Bologna, he's went uh, Gaza at Lazio, and Zidane at Juventus, and up front he's went Batistuta at Fiorentina, and Zola at Cagliari. So that's James' team, not a bad I, shout. All the bro mentions there, they Roberto Mancini actually, because again, Sampdoria in particular, he was wonderful to watch, really, you know, again. I think another cult hero that we've, we've forgotten about is Attilio Lombardo. Aye, so, oh, absolutely. Aye. Do you remember when he was doing the Lombada with James Richardson? No, that, that was prime Saturday morning television. That, and I yeah. apologize to everybody watching for my dance moves there. But <laughs> you, you know, you can take the boy at the lap call, but no lap call at the boy. <laughs> uh, so, um, here we go. Then, um, this was my idea of the podcast. And before I name my team, I just want to thank the three years particularly for the support for this particular podcast, every guy in the comment. I think it's been a, you know, a thoroughly enjoyable podcast and I hope the viewers have enjoyed watching it. But for me, here we go. So I've gone Buffon and goals at Parma and I'm going to play a 4-2-3-1 formation. So a back four, Javier Zanetti representing Inter at right back. I've got Cannavaro representing Napoli at centre back. Nesta representing Lazio at centre-half, and Maldini representing Milan, playing at left-back. Now, my midfield, you might argue that this is one of the guys know his natural position, but there's a reason he's in my team. So my number six, my holding midfielder, is Andrea Pirlo representing Reggiana, season 99-2000. Now, yes, yes. you might laugh at that, but that is actually Andrea Pirlo's second best season in Serie A for goal involvements in terms of goals and assists. So not a lot of people will know that, but that's why I put for him, because that's when he first came to fruition for me. And he made his Serie A debut in 1994 for Brescia. So not a lot of people will know that. He may be, you know, recency bias, you think, because he's such a long career. But he made his uh, Serie A debut in 1994. So for me, Pirlo was the midfielder of a generation. I know a lot of people talk about Xavi as the, you know, the culture midfielder at Barcelona. But for me, Andrea Pirlo could do anything. He had peripheral vision anywhere in the park, could play with his back to goal, long-range passing, dink balls over the top, set pieces. For me, just a complete midfielder. You know, just a joy to watch him play. And as my attacking... Did he not, number... 
Yeah, did Brian. He not do the jump, did he not do the jump from Inter to Milan direct? With, with the loan spell at Rajana in between. So after he came back for that loan spell at Rajana, he see Milan bought him directly for Inter. So, you know, a bit different for Morris Johnson. He didn't need to go to nonce in between, but certainly, you know, that, that would be unheard of in this league. Uh, my attacking number eight, I've went for Ruth Hulett. Now, I know Ruth Hullett played as a 10 and could play right side forward, left side forward. But for me, Ruth Hullett's best position you was running for deep, carrying with the ball. He was, you know, physical, powerful, strong on the ball, could head the ball, terrific range of passing and a great strike. But for me, Ruth Hullett's best position on a football pitch was when he was arriving late into the box. And that's where I, you know, fancy him best. There's a number eight. And he played there sort of more laterally towards the end of his career. But for me, Ruth Hullet and Pirlo are my midfield two. So my front three behind the striker, so my sort of three number tens, as Michael Beal would call it, but sort of right to left, I went Francesco Totti on the right-hand side because Totti is the second, uh, you know, in, in the all-time scoring charts of Italian football. And not a lot of people know that. And for me, he doesn't get enough credit. I, you know, loyalty in football... It is gone these days. It doesn't exist. Money dominates. But to play for his boyhood club and stay there for all his years, for me, such a culture football player, captain this club, captain this country, Francesco Totti doesn't get enough credit as far as I'm concerned. And he, nearly got 10, bombed, and he nearly got bombed out by a manager. That's true. That's true, Brian. And in my number 10, I went for at Bologna, Roberto Baggio. He had his best goal season at Bologna, Roberto Baggio. He scored 23 goals and 30 appearances at Bologna. A man that had been plagued by injuries, sort of mid to late 90s, and he had a resurgence in his career, so much so that he then got back into Giovanni Trapattoni's Italian squad as a result of it, off the back of it. Just for me, a player that you love to watch. The divine ponytail, but for me, the divine footballer. Just a, a, you know, a pleasure to watch and every week on you know Gazzetti Football Italia. And for me, the guy that you all left out, Alessandro Del Piero on the left-hand side, in the three behind the striker. I've never seen someone, although Michael, Michael Richards claims he burst onto the scene, nobody burst onto the scene more than Alessandro Del Piero. For me, you know, I watched him at Ibrooks close at hand, Andy Gorham come off at half-time, and Billy Thompson replaced him for the second half. And Del Piero was running rings, run Alec Cleland, you know, over the two legs. Just such a talent, you know, could do anything with the ball. He sort of lost his pace in his latter years, but, you know, very skillful. You know, could take the ball, was back to goal, could beat two or three players, and a terrific finisher, something that I never think he, he got credit for. But, you know, he had that sort of culture finish where he would square the goalkeeper up and he would hit the side netting with it every time. And that's what you want a striker to do for me. And I, I just couldn't leave him out. And as you guys have all got, I've got him too, Gabriel Batastuta. And I think for me... Gabriel Batastuta is the central number nine. You've got to have Batastuta because this is a guy that, that played for a provincial club in Italy at the time, got relegated with them and brought them straight back up, stayed with them. Uh, and then when he left them at the end of his contract and, and joined Roma, he, he took Roma to the first league title in so many years. Uh, and for me, you know, I think it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, but Astuta just didn't win more trophies because he had a career that you know, was befitting of it. For me, the, the most complete number nine that, that you'll ever see. And for me, he did it over a longer period than anybody. And I think when you see him at Old Trafford in the Champions League playing against a top Manchester United team, he tore them to shreds. Uh, and for me, the greatest. Uh, and... With that, that is the end of the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you so much for watching. Thanks to Scott, Brian and Robert for, for you know, joining me for tonight. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I hope you have too.